many physical systems self-organize spontaneously to produce patterns that can be beautiful and very complex, like these uh, sunny dunes in the desert, or the pattern of streamlets in the river delta, or again the cracks that appear on the surface of a ceramic uh, plate. All these patterns are interesting because we can try to understand how complex forms appear from the interaction of materials and the units that compose the system. In many biological systems, we also observe similar pattern formation phenomena. Here is the example of leaf veins that in terms of mechanisms can be explained as the result of similar uh, mechanisms as the uh, cracks that I showed in the previous slide. But what is important when we talk about living systems is that these patterns also have a function. In this example, for instance, the veins carry water and nutrients across different parts of the leaf and having a network that is highly meshed like this one will ensure that the network is robust to random disconnections. These disconnections have happen quite often, in fact, as every time that the plant is in the stress of lack of water, tiny bubbles appear inside the veins and these bubbles have to be uh, repaired, uh, dissolved again. So uh, this is the main focus of my research, understanding how pattern formation in living systems leads to different functions. Another example of pattern formation is trail formation by ants. Also in this case we can try to understand the, uh, pro the phenomenon in terms of mechanisms. Each ant moves around, more or less performing a random walk, and they leave tiny drops of pheromone wherever they go. But in turn, ants are attracted by the pheromone left by other individuals so that there is a positive feedback mechanism that means that a, a pattern is formed like the one that you can see on the right of the slide and again this pattern has also a function in value this is the way how the colony explores the environment depending on this pattern dep uh, me depends whether or not the colony will find food for instance one of the uh, pattern formation phenomena that I've studied a little bit in more detail is flocking. In this case, the pattern is the pattern of movement of tens, hundreds or even thousands of animals that move together in synchrony. We can try to understand this in terms of mechanisms, how each individual coordinates its actions, its movement with other individuals, but of course there is a function associated with this, for instance, whether or not a fish will be eaten by a predator. The study of collective motion has been long the focus of statistical physics. That uh, was interest, a statistical physicist are interested in understanding how different types of collective patterns emerge from different interaction rules at the individual level. For instance, here, if you have individuals that align with each other, but are not too strongly attracted to each other, the flock will behave like a moving droplet. Inside the droplet, individuals are free to move with respect to each other, but the flock as a whole will move as a single unit. If instead, for instance, attraction is high and alignment is low, then the flock will take a configuration that is similar to a crystal and so on. So we can try to understand how different phase transitions and different collective patterns emerge from local interaction rules. The same topic has also been of interest for computer scientists that have tried to uh, produce animations, to animate characters for uh, uh, computer simulations, video games and animation movies. And uh, one of the first results in this sense dates back to 1987 when Craig Reynolds proposed one of the popular models in which 
individuals need to interact with their neighbors according to simple rules. So the focal individual in red here will update its direction of movement, its velocity, as a function of the previous velocity and of the position and velocity of all the neighbors. In particular, the focal individual will be attracted to neighbors when they are far in this yellow zone. It will try to align with neighbors that are in the blue zone so that they flock together and then it will move away from neighbors in the green zone to avoid collisions. All these models show that simple rules are sufficient to produce very complex and beautiful patterns. However, there is a limitation, which is that these models are not fitted to empirical data. So we don't know if the predictions of these models are actually valid for real flocks of animals. We cannot really make predictions about the real behavior of these animals. And a large part of my research over a few years has consisted in trying to fit these self-propelled particle models directly on the movement measured through video tracking or uh, GPS tracking of different animals of fish, prawns, pigeons and uh, different uh, other types of animals. Today I do not have time to go through all these uh, papers but I wanted to show you uh, one example with homing pigeons. You all know that when you release a homing pigeon is homing and it, it goes back home to the home loft and if you release two of them in a pair they try to stay together because they are uh, gregarious animals and so if we attach some gps loggers on the back of the pigeon we can try to see exactly how they move and in particular we can try to infer from data the interaction rules that are implemented in different models. So we can try to make plots based on the real data of how a focal individual here in the center of the map interacts with neighbors in terms of changing direction. In this case, there is an attraction to neighbors that are far away in these zones and repulsion fr from neighbors that are very close. Or in terms of changing direct directions, in this case, the uh, focal individual will speed up if the neighbor is in front. Once we have these models that are similar to those that have been studied for a long time, but with an important difference, which is that they are fitted directly on experimental data, we can run simulations. And we can try to make predictions about collective level patterns. One of these predictions for the case of pigeons is quite important. When you, you need to, I need to stop for a second and, and go back and explain you something. When you release these pigeons many times from a certain place, they learn to go back home. Initially, they're not very good, then they improve. And as they learn, they develop a stereotype route. They always take the same path to go back home. So if you release one pigeon 20 times, say, they will take always this path. If you release another pigeon, maybe it will develop an alternative path that is different and they stick to their own preferred choice. But when you release them together, there is a conflict because on one hand, they want to stay together. Say the red one has developed this path, the blue one has developed this path and together they fly along the black path. They need to take this uh, compromise or alternative they need to split but they don't like splitting so that doesn't happen very much and our simulation models now inferred from directly from the rules predicts that a pigeon that flies naturally a little bit faster of course when they are together they fly at the same speed but if there is one that has a slightly faster preferred speed because of the asymmetry in the interaction rules that individual will have a disproportionate influence on the decisions of the group and it will lead the choice of the route. So this is what the model predicts. When they have the same preferred speed, there is no decision or there is one random decision for, for they, they, they fly together, but then they, they choose one of the two preferences. But here uh, we have two individuals with two different preferred routes. And uh, one, this one, in this case, the one that has this preferred route is a little bit faster. And when they fly in pair, they tend to immediately choose this uh, route. 
And this is something that uh, my colleagues, biologists, could test uh, and verify that it was actually the case in the real data. So this is one, one example of how, by focusing on living systems, we can study the mechanisms. And if we study these mechanisms uh, with great accuracy, we are now able to make predictions about the function of, of uh, particular set of interaction rules. The study of collective motion is one of the areas of my research, but it's not the only one. I've studied for a long time the formation of spatial patterns and structures, like uh, in particular the nest of social insects, and I will talk about this later. I've studied also other self-organization phenomena at the ecological level, for instance, the assemblage of a uh, community of organisms, in this case of different species, that live together and uh, there are mechanisms that allow fitting together in certain space organisms of different types, of different sizes, but these mechanisms have an, an important implication, which is whether or not some species survive in a given environment. And then uh, another area of my research involves still a self-organization phenomenon, if we want, but a slightly different one, which is how different areas of the brain organize together to create a stable perception of the external world. And I illustrate this with an example. Here is a visual illusion in which we all see a central square as being brighter than the background. However, the square is actually the same luminosity as the background, and this can be visualized by just covering the edges. And you can now see that the internal square and the background are exactly the same. So this is important because it means that some cells on our retina that point to the center of the square will see a region, which is just gray, exactly in the same way as the cells of our retina that point to this other region. But somehow, inside the brain, they need to make consensus and decide uh, what they actually see, which is different. And uh, this difference of brightness has to be produced. So by changing the properties of the, this image in terms of the uh, uh, special characteristics or, or the Fourier spectrum that composes the image, it was possible, for instance, to uh, generate other images that uh, have this exactly the same contrast, the same characteristics, but where, for instance, edges are converted into lines or some special frequencies are missing, so that we can precisely understand how, inside the brain, different information is integrated across brain areas. Now, uh, today, for the purpose of this presentation, as there isn't too much time, I would like to focus a little bit more in detail on something that I've been working in the past, but again more recently, which is the problem of structure formation by social insects. Uh, here you have a, a phenomenon where thousands or e sometimes even millions of insects coordinate together to produce structures that are incredibly big, and they are not just random structures, they are coherent at the global scale. This is a clear self-organization phenomenon, which we would like to try to understand for different reasons. First of all, because if we understand it, we might be able to reproduce it, for instance, in uh, robotics, in collective robotics. But also, more generally, as a window to understand other self-organization phenomena in, in, uh, in our world. Social insects are able to produce very complex and beautiful nests, and this is not true only of termites, of wasps, ants, also make impressive nests. And uh, I focused a little bit more on termites because uh, they are probably uh, the best architects in the natural world. This is a species of termite that lives in Africa and makes nests that are about 20 centimeters of height that look like mushroom from, from the outside. And inside they are full with these chambers connected by tiny corridors. And uh, it's very difficult to make, to get an idea about what it's the actual structure of these nests because it's very complex and chaotic. 
So one way how we studied them was by bringing the nest to the hospital to take X-ray tomographies. And based on these tomographies, we can then visualize the internal structure, all the chambers connected together, and map exactly the structure onto a network. Once we have the network, it's easy to uh, study it with the tools of, of network analysis. One first observation that is quite obvious is that these networks, in this case, at least for these species, are very sparse. You see that many components of the network are like trees with just one single path connecting them to the rest of the, of the network. And this is quite surprising if you consider that each chamber is like almost a sphere, it's a packing of spheres, so you would have in principle 12, maybe 14 neighbors to connect to, and they just choose to connect to one, two, three, a small number. One explanation of this is that in these species, the uh, colony is often attacked by ants that prey on the uh, young termites, and their main defense mechanism is provided by these individuals, the soldiers, that have large head and with the head block the access to corridors. If you have this defense strategy, you can imagine that it's particularly good to have a network that is not uh, much connected and it has many components that are tree-like. Because if ants enter some part of their nest, say here, then you can isolate this entire part by closing with your head one single hedge, one single corridor in the network. The same nests are also impressive for another reason, because we can consider uh, how they are made and the, the alternative options for connecting nests, uh, for connecting chambers inside this structure. So the, the full set of connections is very large. Here is shown on a 2D slide, but of course it is in 3D. And uh, you can imagine that each chamber could be connected to multiple neighbors. How do they pick those neighbors? We can see that in the nest made by, uh, by termites, the uh, actual network that is realized has a path length that is uh, like this. While if they pick, if you try to pick randomly the neighbors according to different rules to keep you to preserve the same degree distribution and so on, you always end up with networks that are less efficient, that have a longer average path length. So uh, we, we could find a reason for this, which would be that termites actually pick a subset of uh, connections but they don't do so in a random way. They do so by selecting uh, connections that have high centrality. And, and this is not impossible as a biological mechanism because we know that these insects leave pheromone where they go. So the pheromone essence, essentially is a way to mark locally the centrality of their path. And by choosing to retain connections that have more pheromone, higher centrality, they end up building networks that have, on average, a shorter path length. In uh, recent years, I've been interested in another example of termite nest. It's a completely different species. This is a species, it's a group of the genus of termites, a group of termites that lives in Australia, and they make very interesting structures. Um, first of all, the structure is completely chaotic. It looks like a series of uh, uh, noisy corridors that go in all directions. And we would like to understand the function of these structures and also the building mechanisms. In terms of the function, one thing that we immediately notice is that while the structure at the global level is chaotic, locally we have many features that uh, have a saddle shaped configuration. Now, there is something that uh, uh, you need to know, that the building material of these uh, structures is similar to paper. Mm? Paper is a very good material, but it has a problem. It bends, okay? And the solution to this problem, to make it stable, for instance, is what I call the pizza slice problem, 
If you have a surface that bends, the solution is to give some curvature in the other direction so that it doesn't bend anymore. Hmm? And uh, if, you, if you actually give the right curvature to your surface, you can support very strong loads on, 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 your, on your material like this. Hmm? But the, the same material will not be very strong in the other direction, in the uh, perpendicular direction. So if you have a surface that is bent in all directions, we are going to have something that is very robust in terms of mechanical resistance. In fact, these minimal these surfaces resemble some geometric figures like the geroid, which are known as minimal surfaces and which have been shown to offer very strong mechanical resistance for little weight. Mm? But there is a difference between the termite nests and the geroid. And the difference is that the termite nest is a chaotic version of geroid. Hmm? Now, this could appear some uh, problem, but it's, it could actually be a, a good feature to be chaotic. The reason is that the geroid, by having a almost crystal-like structure, is, uh, yes, it's very strong, but when it breaks, it typically breaks suddenly in a, a catastrophic failure. This is uh, expressed in these graphs. Uh, here you have a graph that is more similar to what you would find for the geroid, in which you, as, as you increase the strain, hmm, like this, you put in a press and, and uh, compress, you can measure the pressure and it increases. So, so all, this, all this part is almost an elastic uh, reaction. It's strain and stress are proportional. But all of a sudden, it collapses. Well, when you have a chaotic structure more similar to our termite nests, you have diff various cycles of compression and failure, like this. Hmm? You increase the strain, it, it breaks a little bit, and so on. And because the total energy absorbed is the uh, area under this stress-strain profile, on average, termite nests can absorb much more energy. So these are quite way of folding, quite, quite nice ways of, uh, let's say, folding paper if you want to achieve something that offers quite good mechanical uh, properties. And what about the building mechanism? Um, it's very difficult to study the building mechanism of these termites in the lab. We have some collaborators that have termites in their lab and we try to put a webcam that day after day films their behavior. Mm. And uh, only once, over two years of monitoring, we were able to observe something uh, that is an ep episode of uh, building behavior. But that of course happened uh, over the Christmas break when the uh, lab was closed in just a few hours out of two years of monitoring. But uh, if, if the experiment cannot help us much to understand how these structures are built, the uh, insight can help a little bit more. Uh, now, these nests comprise, as I showed before, comprise all these surfaces that move in three dimensions. Uh, other species of termites comprise pillars that branch in different directions. All these structures for us are structures that can easily grow if you have a mechanism of growth in which you add pellets at the places where there is the highest curvature. A surface has the highest curvature here on top and it will keep growing. A pillar has the highest curvature here on the top and it will be, uh, keep growing. And because there are instabilities in the growth of this tip, it is very also very easy to produce branching, which is another feature of these nests. So we implement a, a model that, uh, that simulates nest growth based on curvature, and we can reproduce many of the features of, of these nests. Growing pillars that uh, merge together and branch, uh, and by adding some boundary conditions, we can also reproduce the external uh, closure of the nest and so on. However, again, as in the many of the examples that I made before, these are 
the examples in which we simulate a rule that we figured out, but we have no evidence that this is the rule that actually operates in the system. So how can we test this? We uh, visited some collaborators and did some experiments on uh, actual termites by offering features like uh, artificial pillars or walls we, that offer a, a curvature queue. And we see that uh, building activity focuses on the places of higher curvature, which is good. In the case of a wall, it doesn't uh, focus on the top of the wall, but here on the corners, more, most often, which again are the regions of highest curvature. So far, so good. We, we kind of validate our model, but with the caveat that we see that there is also some pellet deposition here on the edges of the uh, of clay. This, the simulation models predicts exactly the same. And this, these uh, uh, pellet depositions of the edge of the clay are difficult to explain because here in this particular place there isn't much curvature uh, attracting deposits. So why? Even, even if there are no cues, they still deposit here. So th this must be a region that is analogous to a region with high curvature, but some other cue uh, should be present. In order to understand what that cue could be, we need to remind that uh, at, uh, so at, at, at our own scale, at the large scale, uh, the evaporation of water from a surface, for instance, if you have a, a ball as big as a tennis field, the evaporation of water from one unit of surface will be proportional to the surface. So if it is as big as a tennis field, the, the evaporation would be proportional to the area. If it is smaller, like a football, then it will be again proportional to the area. But at the micro scale, at the scale of uh, termites, for instance, this is no longer the case because we are now in a diffusive viscous regime and it was shown already 100 years ago by Langmuir that small droplets of water evaporate as a proportion not of the curvature but of the radius of the sphere. This is something that you can uh, show uh, easily mathematically and you can, uh, you can just write the diffusion equation in uh, spherical coordinates and try to solve given the boundary conditions that you have an evaporating radius uh, surface here at rs and the flux of evaporation per unit surface is proportional to one over rs so one over the radius is actually the curvature of the sphere and so we, we come back to our own uh, proof so this predicts that the evaporation should exactly match the curvature of local features. And uh, there is also an extreme case, case which was shown more recently in, in which the evaporation for, of uh, coffee drops from, if you drop uh, some coffee on the table, you will observe uh, a ring along the of, of deposits along the edge because this is, at the contact line, this is the place where there is the highest evaporation. And in fact, this matches what we would expect in terms of this uh, disk of clay. But how can we prove it experimentally? The idea that we had was to repeat the experiment, this time without putting any termites, but adding salty water, water plus sodium bicarbonate, to the setup. And as the water evaporates, it will form crystals, and we have these crystals appearing exactly at the top of the pillars or on the edge of the clay, exactly the regions where termites have been. And we can also do simulations and, and show that uh, the same is also expected by assuming evaporation only. So I, I use this example to uh, um, illustrate a little bit how we can make multiple links uh, between pattern formation function, for instance, the mechanical resistance or the properties of a material that is emerging from this self-organization phenomenon. And uh, in this way, we can link self-organization 
of different uh, organisms or objects to a particular function. If we un come to understand well the mechanisms that link a particular self-organization phenomenon to a desired function, then we can also imagine to implement something similar in the engineered systems to create systems that self-organize and do something that we would like them to do. So I finished for today. There are other topics that I haven't covered. I hope that you will stay in touch in case you would like be interested in, in collaborating on any of these uh, topics or other topics related to this. Thank you.